Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. It's your weekly look at all things royal brought to you by The Mail. Harry and Meghan in court, the King and Zelensky and will Prince Andrew write his own memoir? I'll be discussing all of this and more with The Mail on Sunday's assistant editor Kate Manzi and The Daily Mail's editor Richard Eden. Back from his deathbed. Welcome. <laughs> your fans rejoice. Well, it seemed like it was inevitable. The horse-loving woman who took Prince Harry's virginity before smacking him on the rump and sending him to Grey's has given her first interview. That's right, Sasha Walpole gave her side of the story in a fascinating interview with The Mail on Sunday. Kate, I'm going to come to you first. While she was happy to give the interview, it doesn't sound like she was particularly thrilled with the way Harry handled the whole thing. Well, yeah, this was the inglorious episode that he so memorably described in his book. Um, and obviously now we know who she is, Sasha Walpole. She's 40. He had said that she was an older woman. Um, we didn't realise she was going to be just two years older, so I don't know what that what he would refer yes, to his wife as. Yes, was he trying as. to give himself a sort of like a glamorous MILF narrative there? Was that what was going on? But, uh, <clears throat> you know, she, she rightly said in the interview, um, I've kept this secret for 21 years. He sort of outed her. He didn't name her in the book, um, but everybody who knew them at that time knew that it must be her. And I think she just thought, well, all my friends know. She had, the, you know, her phone started pinging and they were saying, you know, have you seen the Daily Mail? She said, no, why? Prince Harry's book, oh my goodness, you're in it. That's you, isn't it? That was oh, the episode. God. And so she's frantically, you know, getting hold of this book and reading the episode and goodness, she's not named, but everybody around her knew that it was her. So I think it was only a matter of time. She thought, well, I'm going to have my say. And I don't know if she's upset with him for mentioning it. She just said, you know, he could have phoned me and told, you know, told me, or he could have let me know, or hey, just not include it at all. So it's strange how he did include it, and I don't know the purpose of it really. He had that interview with Tom Bradby, if you remember, and he seemed a bit grumpy when Bradby inter you know, interviewed him and asked him about that point in the book. And yes. he said, well, Why don't we talk about you losing your virginity, Tom Bradby? And Tom sort of going, well... Well, I didn't write mine in a book. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, you do wonder what kind of pressures were brought to bear by the publishers on that one, because I'm wondering if he perhaps now regrets including it. Well, I don't know. Richard, you suspect, don't you, that he won't really see himself in the wrong here, will he, Harry? No, I mean, the reason Harry included this um, brief episode in his book was for dramatic... Brief. How rude. How rude. <laughs> I think Sasha says, <laughs> Sasha says five minutes, I think 15 minutes away from the pub. It was, it was Five brief. minutes for the issue. Uh, no, the, re the reason he included it was it did actually play an important dramatic purpose. Now, what that was was that he had a visit from his um, long-term mentor, Mark Dyer, known as Marco in the book, who came to Eton to visit him and to quiz him about something. And he felt very nervous because he thought that Marco had come to quiz him about um, this episode with Sasha Walpole that he thought might have been seen by others. <coughs> right. Well, anyway, it turned out that Marco had come to grill him about drugs because people had um, they'd had reports from journalists that he'd been seen, um, I think it was smoking cannabis or taking other drugs. And he wanted to ask him about this. And to Harry's great shame, and he admits it was one of the few things actually in his book he admits he was ashamed of, he lied to someone he trusted most of all, Marco, and he told him that it was untrue mm. about the drug. So he, he just mentioned the um, virginity in that context in the book. So it's quite brief. You know, but he's put it all out there. This great privacy campaigner has, you know, just abolished his own privacy. And I suppose she's probably had um, some criticism for coming forward, but it's the kind of thing whereby you'd probably always be looking over your shoulder until you put your hand up and said it was me. You know, she must have always been... I can imagine newsrooms going, let's find this woman, who is this woman? I think that was an awkward moment when she hit before the story broke and she had to tell her father, <laughs> well, actually, it was me, which is not something she'd probably want to break to her, to her dad. Oh, but, wow. Um, I, I always wonder with these and with the drugs, where were the close protection officers in all this? You know, if he was being guarded 24-7, you just wonder what they were. And maybe they thought, well, he's a lad, you know, let him Grabbing have some and privacy. Keeping safe yeah. distance. Well, he he's makes really clear that he managed to escape um, the protection officers. But we read at length, don't we, in the book about all the drugs that he did repeatedly. The, the drugs thing is shocking, actually. Um, you know, there's so much... Drugs are featured so heavily in the book and they play such a large part in Harry's life, really. That's quite surprising when he's had 
protection officers, mm -hmm. but but they are there. I mean, he, you know, he has put them consistently in a very awkward position because he has been breaking the law consistently while with um, police officers. And that puts them in a, in a very awkward position. Oh my! Well, speaking of the Sussexes and the law, Kate, we could be hearing more from them, um, and because of a new U.S. court case. Well, yes, this is the case about Samantha Markle. So this is Meghan's half sister, who last March launched a defamation case against Meghan. She said, or she alleges, that Meghan defamed her when she gave the Oprah Winfrey interview. Remember Harry and Meghan's Oprah Winfrey interview? And yes, I do. <laughs> Samantha Markle says that in that interview, you know, Meghan said she wasn't close to her and didn't know her very well, and she said that that was malicious and that damaged her own, Samantha's own reputation. So she's seeking 75,000 US dollars in damages. Now, why this is back in the news again is because there had been a request not to allow depositions in the case. So the US viewers will know this, but the UK viewers, it's probably less uh, familiar word, but this will be where they get questioned. So Meghan and Harry had requested to the judge that they wouldn't have to do the depositions, but the judge ruled this week that um, they've thrown out that request. So it looks as if Harry and Meghan may have to answer difficult questions as part of the depositions for this court case in the US. Which so is that the same as literally taking the stand or is that... Is it could be. I, I'm not an expert on US law, but I understand it could be. And people who've watched Suits will probably be familiar with some of this, of course, ironically. Um, sometimes they film them and that kind of that, that can be filmed in a lawyer's office and that can be used as part of the evidence. Richard, that's if this goes ahead, there's the potential for some really uncomfortable questioning, isn't there? Certainly the questions will be awkward. I think that that will be the purpose of um, Samantha Markle's questions for them. I'm not clear if we will see the videos, though, if it's video link I, from what I've read we may not but we'll certainly hear what their answers are and and they will hate it you know I mean they, they love giving their video links that they do you know for charity or whatever from their home in Montecito but the last thing they want to do is to be you know put on the spot and have to ask uh, answer some very difficult questions what, I mean what sort of questions do you think they might get can you speculate um, well I think it'd be a truthfulness about the past that seems to um, I think Meghan's been very keen to dismiss um, Samantha as someone she barely knows, and mm. I think Samantha would want to press her on that. And so it's really close family matters and also her relationship with her father that, as we all know, is a very sore point. And he's also been, they also want to interview him as part of the, the court process as well, and he, he's getting on as well, not in great health, so that'd be interesting see, to see how that pans out. Mm. It's just this yeah, never a dull moment, isn't there? <clears throat> this endless dirty laundry, it seems. Well, Megan's saying that it should be thrown out because how can a jury um, be asked to assess how close a half-sister's relationship is? So, um, yeah, but, but it's not great publicity, and this sort of publicity can't can't be welcomed by the mm. Sussex surely. I mean, usually they love court cases. We've seen endless court cases in this country, but we haven't seen, you know, anything in America. Well, this so is the this other is side, isn't it? This yeah. is where yeah. someone's they're, they're being dragged to court, yeah. Mm. So this is one to watch. Well, yes, watch this space, but let's hear some of your thoughts now. And after our discussion about the coronation last week, Natalie Bellinger says, King Charles is giving reason to people who said he was not cut out to be king. Since he took the place of his mother, it is only family stories that we hear. I think it's disrespectful to Camilla, Catherine and William to think of inviting Harry. I think a statement from the palace that they won't be invited would calm everyone down. After all, Charles must consider the opinion of the people more than his feelings. Hmm, well, let's see. But Law Graves believes the Princess of Wales is onto a good thing with her early years initiative. She says, as a mother, I love Princess Catherine's initiative. I use these ideals raising my children and they grew to adults wonderfully. Well, congratulations to you, Laura. Picking up on the criticism that the Prince and Princess of Wales faced after their trip to the food bank, which we talked about last week, lots of you annoyed by that. And here's what Snowflake says, had to say. On William and Catherine's food bank visit, I do appreciate all the critical comments. It's important to hear them out. My opinion is that they were visiting, their visiting raises awareness that food banks are needed more than ever. And I personally would like to see the royal family lead on helping highlighting communities with poverty and what we can all do to help ensure people have the basic necessities of life. 
Please do keep those comments and questions coming in. You can leave them below. You can email us on palace at mailplus.co.uk or let us know on social media where we are at mailplus. Right, so in the Daily Mail at the weekend, the paper's editor-at-large, Richard Kay, wrote an interesting piece looking at what Prince Andrew's next steps might be. Shudder, shudder, shudder. Richard, with the Duke's choices limited, uh, Richard Kay raises the spectre of Andrew writing his memoirs. Oh, my goodness. Can, can <laughs> I you, know, that's my can, reaction. <laughs> can, can you imagine? Um, but but it, it's a really interesting point by Richard Kay because... You know, previously it's unthinkable to write, you know, a royal memoir. I mean, remember there was um, there was a nanny years ago, was it um, Crawford, who who wrote oh, a memoir, Crawford, yeah. yeah, and she was excommunicated. You know, it was a real sort of horror what happened to her. I mean, my goodness, even the um, the boss of Rigby and Pella, the um, you know the bra the makers, bra. she just mentioned her work for the Queen in a memoir that she wrote, and she was stripped of her royal warrant. So you know, it was a well, real. You can't be invoking the image of the Queen's bosoms. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Anyway, it was a real no no. But but Harry's um, you know writing his book has really thrown all that um, you know out there, and it's it's now. I mean, what we've seen is the royal family haven't reacted. They made a point of not reacting to Harry's book. They haven't made a fuss. They've declined to comment, that sort of thing. So in a way, that's um, Andrew could think, well, why not? But do you think that's possible, Kate? And do you think there's any scenario in which the king could shut that down? I so hope it is possible that Andrew's writing, <laughs> <laughs> writing an autobiography. I would love to read that. Oh. Um, hopefully he wouldn't include any inglorious episodes of losing his virginity, because I think we, the, the nation could be spared that, the world could be spared from that. But um, wouldn't it be a great read? I mean, after the Newsnight interview, and we all thought, goodness, why would he do that? I don't think anything's you know, unfeasible now. Oh. We're in such a weird world of the, of the overshare that I think Andrew still probably thinks, what if only people had, you know, knew my side of the story? Well, I remember think in Harry's could... book, you know, we had his account of his time serving in Afghanistan. But for Andrew, it's, it's much more fascinating. You know, he was flying, you know, decoy missions in his helicopter in the Falklands, extremely dangerous, you know, really brave um, missions he was carrying out. And, and that, that would be great to read about. It would be really interesting. And also, I think what sparked some of this, even if it doesn't happen and perhaps there's kind of gossip within Andrew's ranks that maybe I will do a book, I think this is all coming from Virginia Dufre, of course, who is poised to release a book. Once their settlement, they're, they're both under kind of gagging orders, but once that finishes and that will lift, both will be able to speak again. So I wonder if it's kind of him, you know, setting out his story, well, maybe I'll do a book before well, she releases hers. Well, also, I can imagine a scenario whereby he thinks everybody else is making a bit of coin on this. Wasn't it announced yesterday that Rufus Sewell will be playing him in, is it a television show or a feature film about the news? The best interview. line about that was that that Sewell, because he's such a gorgeous man with these kind of high cheekbones, is going to have these sort of prosthetic jowls kind of made for his face to look like Prince Andrew. So poor Prince Andrew isn't going to like that. But yeah, he probably thinks, well, there's all these books about it. You know, we've heard everyone else's version of events, so maybe I'll have my say. But remember, and I wouldn't put it past him at all. And no, I would love to read it. But remember, King Charles does have, you know, levers to pull. I mean, you know, Andrew lives in a royal grace and favour property, Royal Lodge, you know, lives there still with Fergie in another wing. Well, with a good book deal, he can live wherever he wants. Mm, <laughs> but it's expensive and Charles has agreed to um, keep, you know, paying for security. So, you know, that that's millions of pounds. So he uh, he would be very, very loath to upset his brother, I think. Yeah. Fergie came out the other day on social media, a nice picture of her standing in presumably Royal Lodge in a corridor saying there's lots of things to feel bright and happy about. So I wonder if that was a little hint that there's something fun to come from those. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, let's move on now to the King and President Zelensky, who made a surprise trip to the UK this week, as well as meeting the Prime Minister and addressing Parliament. He also met Charles at Buckingham Palace. Is this a cause that the King cares about? 
Yes, I think we've we've heard a lot from the King um, about how we should welcome refugees, obviously referring to Ukraine um, back when the conflict began. Um, so he was really keen to, to welcome Zelensky yesterday, I think. Um, he went into the 1844 room at, at Buckingham Palace um, and there was a 30-minute discussion with the King. Uh, all we know from that, a lot of it was private about how Britain has been helping and how it might help in future. But what we do know is that, that Charles said that everyone's been very worried about Ukraine and that, you know, I can't tell you how, how, how much we've been thinking about you. Um, so it was a really warm kind of cordial. They had tea, apparently. Um, and it was that kind of it's that kind of public backing, you know, not just the House of Parliament, but he's got the King's backing. Um, it's, a, it's sending a very clear message to to Russia, and and the King is obviously really keen to to help. With well, it's the, a, it, and, but it's a clear political message, isn't it, Richard? Is that not controversial from the King? Um, well, it has been a bit in the past. I mean, you know, King Charles has very much got his eyes wide open when it comes to Vladimir Putin. You know, he compared him to Hitler after the um, annexation of um, Crimea. That caused a lot of controversy when our colleague Rebecca English reported that, because it was something I think he'd sort of said slightly privately, or mm. but it was you know, a comment that made the front page of the paper and it caused real controversy. But those comparisons you know, have, have been borne out by him going on to, to invade Ukraine. So you know, King Charles is very clear about what the threat is. and. You know, yes, it's a bit controversial, but here he's following the lead of the Prime Minister and he's done nothing that's not um, fully with the approval of um, the government. Now, Kate, before the King met Zelensky, he was with you, um, among some others, I might add. But what, what were you doing? There were a few others there as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was at the University of East London, where it was one of the engagements that the, the King had lined up. He'd been to Brick Lane earlier that day. Then he came to the university in Stratford, alone without the Queen Consort. And I think some of these things, you know, they don't get reported because it's, it's not terribly interesting compared to all the other things that were happening yesterday. Kate pulling tyres and, you know, Charles... <laughs> Uh, meeting the king meeting Zelensky, but they are really, really important. And I think he went round and saw um, some babies who had been fitted with kind of electrode caps, and they were being measured to see whether um, their stress levels in an urban environment were uh, higher than those living in a rural environment. And he um, looked around this marvelous kind of pretend hospital ward where medics, trainee medics, are working on kind of mannequins, but they're so lifelike, they blink and they respond to you. And it's really, it's fascinating that he's kind of raising awareness of that sort of work, looking again at sustainability, one of his, you know, great uh, passions. Um, and met with a woman who was looking at the disparity between ethnic minority people um, and, and how they approach sustainability issues, such as are they more likely to get an electric car or not, um, and how some of the, uh, the, the government policies that help us, you know, whether we, whether we get a discount on an electric car or not, who that's really helping in society. Mm. So he's really kind of digging down and it's not just kind of shake the hand and move on. It's, he is really kind of engaging with people. But there was a funny incident uh, just before he went in. People were very, very thrilled to see him. Lots of cheers, all very positive. And a man quite lightheartedly just said, please bring Harry back. And Charles sort of didn't hear him in the crowd. And he said, sorry, you know, and uh, he said, Harry, your son. And Charles sort of went, oh, who? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he gave a sort of uh, kind of kindly sort of chuckle, grandfatherish sort of chuckle and kind of move, move, move swiftly onwards. But um, that's cheeky and brave. It was. <laughs> um, yeah. And also, you know, so, so someone heckles you and you go, Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> you know, he, just, he didn't pretend to, to, to not hear him. You know, he genuinely didn't hear him and asked him again. So I think it's, you know, but he, he handles things so, so well. I mean, and I think that's a lot, a lot of that we don't see, right? Well, that's what we're lucky to have, a, in a way, to have a king who's so experienced. You know, he's been doing this. <laughs> he is very for, experienced, yes. <laughs> for, for decades. Yes. So. And what, what do you make, though, of the choices that he's making for his engagements? There's quite a few planned over the next week or so, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, one thing I have noticed is that so many um, our visits where it's always with non-white people. You know, he's been very keen to show that he's going to be a king for all communities. And I do think there's a sense he's been a bit stung by, you know, supposed race route at Buckingham Palace and then Harry and Meghan's racism accusation. So there have been so many visits where it's with Asian or with black communities, that type of thing. Mm. But, um, you know, that that's good. He's, he's showing he's a king for everyone and um, he's trying to make, 
keep his appeal as broad as possible. Well, that is, I'm afraid, all we have time for today. Thank you to Kate and Richard and to you, of course, for watching. And we will see you this time next week on Palace Confidential. Bye-bye.